Hello everybody, this is Sarah Skavik and you're watching Traffic Musings, episode 100, 100, zero, zero, wait, no, it's gonna be 100, zero, zero. however you guys are seeing this, I don't know what's backwards and what's forwards, ah, so we did it, 100 episodes, woo, where are the fireworks? Editor Sean, I know you can add those fireworks now. I asked them since episode one. Remember? Remember? Hello, everyone. This is Sarah Skopic, and you are watching Traffic Musings, my first episode. Yay! If I could add fireworks, I would. Yeah, see? You can do them now. You have the technology, so do it. Where are my fireworks? Ah, there's the fireworks. Lovely fireworks. Fireworks everywhere. Fireworks are everybody. Beautiful. Man, 100 episodes. Jeez. And I know what you guys are thinking. Sarah, you took like 10 weeks to get to 100th episode. You were at 100th episode like a millennia ago. I know. Listen, things, there was a lot of things going on. And part of it too was I still, I was waiting for something more special to happen for 100th episode. And the initial idea I had did not work out. So I kept waiting and waiting. And then it just kind of presented to do it like this. And you're probably wondering, why aren't we in your car? Because it's traffic musings? Well, the whole thing about musings series or whatever, traffic musings, is the idea of trying to do something while it participating in activity I don't want to deal with. So, for instance, I did the knitting thing because it was something to do. Traffic musings was always about this idea that I hate driving so much and I don't want to fall asleep while driving, so I am going to try to do this thing where I talk to pass the time with the stupid commutes that I do. That's what it's always been about. And that's why when I did my 50th episode, it was sleeping study musings because I was waiting to go through my sleep study. And uh, so what am I doing here? Well, Funny you should ask. I have a snow day today for my current place of employment, so I should normally be at work right now, but I'm not. But something special is also happening today, where it is episode <gasps> eight. I almost forgot which episode we're on. <laughs> it's the next Star Wars, and I'm watching it tonight. Well, by the time you this is upload, I will have already seen it and probably cried. But I am waiting for that to happen tonight because I have tickets and I'm super excited. So the thing is, is that I decided now today would be a meaningful time to start doing tra doing the hundredth episode of Traffic Musings because I thought, you know, well, I'm waiting to go to Star Wars really impatiently, and I am celebrating the fact that I don't have to drive today because snow. Because snow is dangerous to drive in. So I'm here with my nice hot chocolate. Pumpkin spice flavor because I am a white girl. And uh, this is going to be snow day musings. That's what today's called, I guess. I don't know. 100th episode. Let's see where it's going to go. I don't know how long this is going to be. Sleep study musings was 30 minutes because I did an intervals of 10 minutes each because I got really bored. So I don't know how long I'm going to talk today and... Because of the subject matter I've decided to talk about, it might be for quite a bit of time. Here is the thing. I decided that I keep alluding to this story that I've been writing in several episodes of Traffic Musings. I can't even count which ones. But I keep alluding to this story that I'm writing called <gasps> Crystal Crown. And it's really cheesy and silly. But I figured I will open up to let you guys know what it's about. Because maybe in the future I can actually, like, you know talk about <laughs> the story and stuff like that instead of having to be like, well, this is a thing in a story that I'm writing, but I can't give you the full context, so here's this little thing. Well, here today I will give you some context. Now, I'm not going to reveal the full story because, well, I would like to write it someday and there are spoilers in it. Well, not spoilers. Okay, not, sorry, not spoilers. There are plot twists in it that I would rather, you know, have people find out. <laughs> but I will at least try to explain, you know, parts of it and stuff like that. So I'm gonna try to do this in three different sections. So let's get going. The first section, wh what's the plot? <laughs> what is the overarching plot of the story? I can try to explain it in one sentence and the ex best explanation I have for one sentence is a group of teenage adventurers go on a simple fetch quest to prevent another world war. That's, that's the best way to put it. <laughs> and, and I guess I should add, and things get cray cray. <laughs> so that, that's mean the, the basic storyline. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, that's the tricky part because the problem is that it is a fantasy world where I've created different rules and races and stuff like that. And those kind of politics and those kinds of interactions are kind of important to understand why this is important. But I'll try my best to explain it. 
So I created this world where part of the whole history of Thygare, as I called it, the word Thygare comes from me doing a weird amalgamation of Gaia and Earth, and that's what it became Thygare. Anyway, this world of Thygare that I've created was, uh, there, there are these um, uh, six elemental gems, because I'm creative, and they're the six different elements, and this elemental cycle whole thing is actually important. Uh, so you got your basic four. You've got your, your air, your water, your fire, your earth. I added two other ones, plant and lightning. I know it's weird to stick with it. I need to stop saying that. This world was created with these six gems, and they hold a lot of power because they can create that element, because it's the idea of it's they, they are they create something, right? You know, matter cannot be destroyed nor created. These are magical gems that can create things. And so basically, uh, the world was created with these gems. And uh, one day, uh, people kind of discovered that these gems hold a lot of power. People wanted to collect them. There was a huge war that was fought about it. And as a result, uh, a special person who will, I will explain how it was important, named Marthana, who she is a special person because she is what we call a summoner, which I will explain in a minute. She collected all the gems, put them in a big chest and hid them in this little kingdom called Jolivai. And uh, that was the whole thing of peace. It's like, okay, we're going to collect these gems. We're going to put them in the same place so that nobody can use them. And this little kingdom is going to be the one that protects them. Awesome. Cool. Great. So that is, so my story takes place about, uh, I think it's like 92 years after this great war, the great elemental war, I think I called it. And uh, the princess of this kingdom, Joey Vi, Violet, my main character, she's great. Violet, uh, one day, accidentally, <laughs> basically, um, happens to notice that someone is trying to steal these gems, which is a major, major no-no. That ain't good. You're not supposed to do that. And in the process of trying to uh, save the gems, accidentally sends them scattering. And like, cause magical forces, cause magic, shut up. And so as a result of this major, major, major mistake, she is told that she needs to find some followers um, and uh, basically do what Marthana did, you know, almost a century ago at this point, and that is find followers uh, who would be able to help her sense for these gems, go and get the gems back, back to where they belong, and uh, prevent another war, basically. So, man, how am I even going to start this? Okay. The world of Thygare is split up into four races, and... Uh, one thing I'm going to mention at the same time with these four races is when the world was created, I mentioned that they were created with those elemental gems, the six elemental gems. And I don't have the specifics of evolution-wise how these races were created. We're not going to get there. Uh, but the point that you need to know is that these four races um, kind of grew up and congregated near certain gems. And the reason this is important is because everyone has something that is called, every single person, no matter your race, has something called an elemental trait. So think of it kind of like your astrological sign for your birthday, except it's not based on your birthday. Uh, it's based on more of an internal thing. It's really, I haven't quite had a good job of describing it, but it's just another um, trait about you. It's actually, I wouldn't say it's like your astrological sign. It's more like your blood type, actually. You were born with it, it is kind of genetic, and it may determine some things, but it's kind of almost like astrology and what it determines. It's just, but it is genetic. So each race was kind of born, was kind of created and grew up near certain gems. And it'll make sense once I explain what those are. And so as a result, the those energies of those gems kind of bled into these people and resulted in these elemental traits. Now, in the future, um, elemental traits have since kind of been spread around, and most people, especially humans, I will explain, can kind of come in all different elemental traits, but it, this is just an important, because it's an, it's an important identity marker. The first race I, you know, easiest to explain are humans. Humans were born near the earth and the fire gems, and so humans, their ancestors came from fire and earth traits. But basically, humans are humans. Then I have, uh... The naiads, I call it, I, I spell it differently, but the naiads is kind of like mermen, basically. Uh, they are, they mostly live underwater, but you do see them on land. Uh, they were born near the water gem. 
uh, obviously. <laughs> and uh, they can kind of come in different types, but mostly water gem these days. Naiads, for the most part, can live on land. Most of them just live in the water because that they have to at least be in the water for most of most of the day, but they can be on land so they can participate in in the culture, in the international culture of Hygare. So yeah, that's that's their whole thing. There's a lot I'm not revealing, but I can't. Uh, next, the Fae. These are fairies, but they are not tiny. These are like people-sized fairies. So yes, they have wings for the most part. Um, they do have functional wings. Um, they they were born near a uh, plant in air gem. They're kind of like the elves of any fantasy world. That's what the fae are. So they're ones that are more magical that think they're the more wiser ones. They they can live longer um, than most other races, but they're kind of pretentious as all hell and get out. And then the last are a stupid made-up race that I need to redo, but I was like 10 years old when I made this up, called the Psychapians. They're psychic. Yeah. They they were born near the Lightning Gem, um, and they are extremely industrious and uh, intelligent. And the, when I say they're psychic, what I mean is that every Psychapian is born with, like, a one specific talent that is almost, like, psychic in nature. So, yeah, those are kind of my basic four races. And um, I guess I'm trying to think what I should go into next. Uh, so I need to explain summoners. I need to explain how the magic system works. So let's go. Let's go to the magic system. I have no idea how much of this video is going to, how much of this cut's going to end up in the final video. I guess we'll find out. So magic, magic works. Uh, how do I explain this? So magic works in this idea of kind of like spirits. It's, it, I kind of took some ideas from like Shinto religions for this. Uh, it's not exactly that, but that's kind of where I took the ideas from is this idea that there are spirits in our world in the elements. And this idea is that this is how magic is done. Magic is basically just almost kind of praying or asking the spirits to do something for you. So back to the Fae, their magic is actually more of that they are they, they commune basically with the spirits and ask them to do certain things. So if they if there's water, they may commune with the water spirit spirits to move in a certain direction. There's a word I made up for the fae called kenlika, which is the uh, which is that doesn't have a very good translation, of course, in basic. But the idea of uh, th it's kind of looked as like the power level <laughs> of a fae of a fairy, um, how good they are at magic. But what it more translates to is how charming they are, how much the spirits like them. So it's kind of this idea of your power is based more on how charming you are to the spirits. So the reason that's important is because there's a whole other magic thing that I didn't get to that makes humans special. So remember how I said that the world was made with six elemental gems? Well, it's true, but there's one little other artifact I forgot to mention called the crystal crown. <laughs> what is the crystal crown, you're wondering? Good question. That's part of the mystery. There was a small group of humans that grew up around the crystal crown. They were neither earth nor fire humans. They were near the crystal crown. And they are important because they did not develop an elemental trait. They instead um, gained this ability that we call being a summoner. What's a summoner do, you might ask? Well, they summon things, lol. No, they summon these special beings called Daeons. Um, what's a Daeon, you might ask? Good question. A Daeon is seen as kind of a, a, a kind of a, a group of a certain elemental spirit. The thing about Daeons is they don't speak basic and they you can't just speak basic at them to get them to do what you want. They You kind of have to find them. A summoner has to find a Daeon. It's... It's very Final Fantasy X. <laughs> That's literally where this inspiration came from. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So you find the Daeon and you have to learn their language, essentially. And then you have to be able to um, use that. And then you have to be able to understand how to basically order them kind of thing. And, you know, you ask for them to come into the world and then you order them what you need them to do. And then once you thank them and they leave, the world goes back to normal. Let me back up with the history. Humans, you have your fire and your earth humans, and they kind of come together and do their thing. And then there are the summoners. So in early human history, what happened was the summoners kind of woke up to their powers and they're like, wow, we're great. We're awesome. Let's go see what else is in this world. And they see other people like them, but they can't summon Dan's like they can. So they were like, wow, you guys suck. We're going to rule over you. So summoners became basically the first kings and queens of um humans so they developed the first kingdoms human kingdoms 
and they ruled and stuff like that. Well, when there was the Great Elemental War, because the Elemental War was a whole international thing, like everybody was having problems, but humans were having their own internal problems because basically all the peasants were like, you summoners suck because you keep like hurting us and stuff like that. And so then they rebelled. And then at the end of the war, um, they kind of, you know, developed their own um, different systems. And so now modernly in the beginning of the story, there are like almost no human kingdoms left. And they have since kind of tried to become more like a democracy voting representatives, which has its own problems. So <laughs> I'm going to explain real quick about why Marthana is important. I mentioned her earlier. So there is the big war with all the gems. Everyone was fighting over all the gems and stuff. Marthana was kind of this mysterious uh, summoner, even though summoners were not well liked, you know, with the humans, obviously, because they were kings and being overthrown. But she was not part of royalty. She was just simply a summoner. And she... um decided to go around and get all the gems back because she was like this this is crazy and so as part of this um she realized that she needed to do something about the fact that the gems were wildly going out of control so what she did was that she collected a group of people and this group of people were from all different races and the main thing that was important is that each person had a different elemental trait and she imbued a special ability that they would be able to sense and you and basically collect help her collect the elemental gems so she had for instance a human pal that always has the fire trait um and so this person would be able to help seek out where the fire gem was and more importantly once they had the fire gem in their possession it was almost impossible for anyone to take it from them because magic so she had all these people to help her out with this and so they were, and I think I called them the elemental seekers. So once she got them all, she collected them, she put them in this box, she put it in Jolie Vi. Why Jolie Vi, you're probably wondering? Jolie Vi was a small little kingdom um, that had two unique features. One, it was not actually at that time ruled by a summoner. But the main important thing is that it lived right next to the... Um, crystal crown where it was located because the crystal crown is located in a place that no one can get like it's got magical barriers and crap you can't get it so she so she felt that it'd be best to kind of keep the things together and that's the war for you <sighs> exciting stuff i know what's happening now with my story okay so you got that history context violet is a princess of jolivi which is unique because jolivi is one of the like last human kingdoms most human-like nations do not have a king or queen because they kind of fell out of style during the war. And she, not only that, but she's also a summoner, which is extra bizarre because, again, summoners are not looked well upon as a king or queen, much less in general or in any way. Yes, it's also super weird because Jolaiva used to not have a summoner, king, or queen. So this is especially weird, but uh, yeah. Down the line, she got, she is now a summoner. Her mother was as well. How it spreads, it's hereditary. So, um, <laughs> so that's what makes Violet very special. But also means that what she did was a huge screw up. <laughs> so her whole thing is she, she, she found that somebody was trying to steal the gems. Big no-no. She tried to reach for them. Oh shit, they escaped and they're gone. Oh no, she has to go try to find them. So she basically finds out that she needs to try to retrieve them again. She is able to find um, some old things about how Marthana was able to kind of make those seekers I mentioned before, where she kind of chose people and made them that they, you know, could help her on this journey and find those elemental gems. So she and a band of six other people, six of other main characters, that's correct, all go together on this journey to go look for the elemental gems because uh, they, they need to find them because uh, if they don't, people are probably going to start fighting again, which is exactly what happens. And meanwhile, Violet finds out some things about Dayons and about being a summoner that gets kind of weird. So yeah, that's that. Let's go to the characters. That's way more fun. So I'm only going to explain my seven main characters. There are lots of other important characters. I'd rather not get to them right now. So let's talk about Violet. Oh, Violet. My main character. Violet is um, an interesting girl because she she is a princess and doesn't really 
want to be. That's kind of her whole angst. She is thrust into several different roles and several different points of leadership and feels she is not worthy for any of it. It's not that she shies away from it. Quite the opposite, actually. Violet, uh, really, when she finds out that she needs to lead this expedition, basically, goes, okay, I need to lead this expedition. But she does it because people tell her to, not just because she wants to. And so she very much is kind of under this whole idea of this is what I'm supposed to do. This is all my fault. She completely has a guilt complex over everything and she very much is not good at sharing the burdens at all and she really she doesn't do well with that kind of stuff and her so her character growth is very much coming into her own as far as a leader as far as what she wants to do and again she's constantly struggling with this idea of like is it right for me to keep the crown would it be better if we didn't keep the crown so she's she's also very interested in that kind of political play and um, her whole thing also boils down to she doesn't feel prepared for anything. She really plays off an angst that I've had for a very long time and still kind of have and I think is a very worldwide millennial angst, which is this idea of I am this old and I still don't know how to do things things yet what how do I do this thing you know she feels like she's supposed to already know certain lessons and how to do certain things in life and she feels that she's not prepared for it at all the idea of her becoming queen it terrifies her because she knows how old her mother was when she had to kind of basically be queen and uh Violet is about to get in that age and she doesn't think she's ready and so it's a lot of that kind of angst with her so um the other thing about Violet that's really interesting is she does not believe at all in destiny. She very, very strongly believes that everything is a, a choice and a will of other people. So she, the idea of anything being left up to fate and anything being out of her control terrifies her. And she doesn't believe in it at all. I play with this and she is forced to kind of uh, see how maybe she may not be completely correct in those kind of kinds of things, but that is kind of her part of her growth as well. So I'm going to also, I want to do that. I'm going to do this with every character, but you have to understand that these characters kind of came from tropes. Um, again, I didn't play Final Fantasy X, but I kind of grew up with it. And so I recognized all the fantasy tropes and fantasy adventure tropes. So literally every character that I have is based on some kind of trope. So Violet is based based on Yuna a lot in a lot of ways, just kind of that very powerful but uncertain and you know ha doing what's right kind of thing. Next, I will talk about Ember. Ember is uh, Violet's cousin um, on her dad's side. Uh, side note: basically, uh, Violet's mother is royalty. She married a commoner. That's Violet's dad. It was a big hubbub at the time, um, became less of a hubbub later on. So that is how Ember is related, because Ember basically comes from more of a peasant family. But because um, there is still patriarchy that exists within the humans, she and her family don't get much besides the fact that their uncle, which is Violet's father, is, you know, the crown prince. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, Ember is older than uh, Violet, and she is the fire trait. She is hot-headed like the fire. She, uh, very, when she puts her mind to something, she's going to do it. She very much, she's very big on, um, you know, doing things for herself and exploring the world. She hates being stuck in little Jolie Vine and wants to explore the world and everything that comes with it. And um, she, she's just ready to take on the world, ready to explore, ready to journey. But she's already got some prejudice of her, of her own. She thinks Psychapians are super cool. She thinks the Fae are really stuck up and rude. And she she's, she's also, she's just ready to kind of get out the world. Um, she's also, there really is no term for this in Thigar, but she's feminist. Like, the not extreme, but she's like that person that will tell you, remind you of the patriarchy constantly. And she is... Um, uh, how else would I describe her? She, she's just very brazen. She She's very hot-headed. <laughs> but she's also kind of got her own little bit of angst going on. Um, she she kind of questions a lot of things. She's got some bullheaded opinions on stuff. And when she starts traveling the world, she's really forced to kind of erode a bit at those bullheaded opinions and kind of take a step back and really evaluate like how what the things that she really believes in. And... Um, also kind of deals with the fact that 
Maybe she kind of bit off a bit more than she could chew by saying she wanted to travel the world, and maybe she'd rather actually be back home, where it's kind of safer and she's it's comfortable. So she kind of goes through that. Ember, uh, her character type is the type that you would probably see more often played by male characters and less by female characters. She's that hot-headed swordsman um, that really wants to get at it, really wants to go out there and, you know, won't stop, you know, won't stop for anything, but has a bit of angst and is, is kind of a bit angsty at times. Um, and just kind of like grumpy a little bit not super grumpy that's a different person but a little grumpy uh so that's that's ember next i'm going to talk about heather who is ember's younger sister and younger than violet she is air type heather the best way to describe her is she is that happy-go-lucky rogue character that is in almost every final fantasy game because <laughs> she was based off of riku <laughs> Because I love those characters to death. I don't know why. Probably because I like playing rogue characters and I identify with them. Anyway, so Heather's whole thing is she's the youngest person in the party. She um, is very happy and sprightly and, um, you know, is just kind of good with everything. You know, she thinks the adventure is fun. She doesn't, It's but it seems like she doesn't understand the full consequences. The main thing with Heather you have to understand is she's very bubbly. She's very cheerful. She's very childish. She's a little immature at times. But she hates the fact that people always treat her that way. And she goes back to that way because it's the best way that she has found for people to receive her. But at the same time, she hates the fact that her opinions and the way she thinks about the world are seen as... She's afraid that they're seen as childish. She's the person that doesn't understand why people can't get along. Not because she's a child, but because she's like, nobody likes death. Why are we imparting death to everyone? So it's kind of like the wisdom of the children sort of thing. So her angst is constantly overcoming the fact that people kind of have put her in this one, one tr you know, one track mind, this one trope of things, and she doesn't know how to deal with that. All right, next I'm going to talk about Brantle, who's, uh, he is of the water trait now. He's of a different family. Uh, basically, Brantle's family, and I'm going to explain his other two siblings in a second, they came to Jolivai um, for a political reason that I'm not going to get into. Their father and um, Violet's grandfather know each other. That's all I'm going to say on the matter. And um, so, he, so, but the main connection is that it turns out that Brantle is something special to Violet. He is what we call a bonded partner. And I'm not going to get into it, but the whole idea is that summoners are actually pretty weak for the most part and by that I mean I mean like mentally and physically because their whole thing is that they actually are constantly bombarded with the voices of the elements because of the kind of stuff that they do so Brandel's her bonded partner and yes the romantic interest because I am sappy and I am a huge <laughs> I am a sappy fan of the stupid soulmate uh romance which I know doesn't make sense but I'm really sappy and into that and that's basically what this is it was an excuse to have that that's all it was shut up i was 10 anyway so that's that's how he is connected so he's kind of um i think i mentioned he's water trait right so brantle is when you first meet him he i kind of make fun of the whole mysterious knight thing because that's what he appears at first he's just this dark mysterious knight um guard for violet who doesn't say anything who is extremely obsequious that does everything she asks and is like seemingly perfect he's handsome and perfect but she hates him she hates it because he doesn't talk for himself he just he just stands there and just does whatever she wants and um his whole thing is he was bred to be the best to be groomed to basically be married off basically and so he was bred to be the perfect gentleman to follow all of his father's instructions to fo to follow exactly what he needed to do to get far in this world and um now he is being and so now he's on this quest and he is violet's bonded partner so he feels a responsibility to protect her and so now he kind of has a similar thing with violet where it's like he is not making his own choices so how do we get him to make his own choices? And that's kind of what they do for each other. The thing about Brantle that's really interesting is he is extremely interested in politics. He's an annoying guy that, like, you kind of hate to have at parties because he'll try to always be tell you logic and reason why one, you know, one method of doing things is better than the other. Yeah. And he kind of learns to get over it. But his whole thing is he thinks monarchies are one of the worst types of government institutions because of, you know, the power structure. So he and Violet are not together, and she's a princess. <laughs> what does that mean for him? So that's kind of their whole dynamic. And 
in the beginning, you know, they don't, they, they, of course, at first they don't seem to like each other. Well, no, she doesn't really like him. He thinks she's just fine, but she doesn't really like him. And then they kind of get to know each other and then, you know, things get better from there. But he, he's very protective and supportive, but he's got his own things to kind of work through and also, you know, trying to kind of stand up for himself. The other special thing about Brantle, that's weird, is he can breathe underwater. Mm -hmm. He, it's, they, you don't really know why till later on, but he is like a naiad in that way that he somehow is able to breathe underwater, which is very strange. So he's an excellent swimmer, which is great. And he, so his whole trope is, he's, it's funny, he's kind of a mix of tropes. He is both that stereotypical trope that's usually inhabited by women, the whole like, bred to be the perfect, you know, bride kind of thing. He's got that going for him, but he's also that kind of Lancer, you know, dark, mysterious, does it, you know, just kind of protector kind of thing. Next we have Kathy. Kathy is the lightning trait. She is the oldest party member. She um, is Brando's older sister, so she's the oldest member. She's just like a few months older than um, Ember, and she is the mommy of the group. She very much, uh, she, she's honestly happy-go-lucky, but she is extroverted, she loves people, she likes being around people, she's very nosy, she gets in people's problems, she's trying to solve people's problems, she's the constant mediator and constant busybody of everybody. And um, the reason she can do that is because her weird thing is that she can read surface thoughts of people. But Sarah, I thought only Psychapians had psychic powers. I know, you need to wait and find out when I'm finished with the book. So that's kind of her thing. And <clears throat> it's very exhausting for her because she is human and should not be able to do that. But at the same time, she is able to use this ability to kind of understand people on a very different kind of level. So she, I'm not sure what kind of character trope she falls under, to be honest. She was the weirdest character to design because I didn't really know what I wanted her to be like. She kind of started off as a Mary Sue just the way I created her, and I didn't know what to do with her. I just knew she was important, and as I started writing her, she ended up being me, basically. Kathy is the most me character of the group. She's not an author insert. She just, she didn't have a lot in common. She's kind of made herself the glue between the whole group. Whenever there's an argument, she's the one that has to figure it out. So her whole thing is kind of realizing that you can't please everybody. You know, you, you can't help every single person. You just can't do it. Sorry. And next we have Sander. He is the youngest of um, Brantle and Kathy. And she, and sorry, he is, um, uh, he, he is actually more closer in age to Heather. Um, he is of Earth trait. And he may be the youngest, but he certainly doesn't seem to act like the youngest. He, this guy is broody as all heck get out. He didn't seem to have anything special about him, unlike his siblings. Um, and one thing also that I kind of forgot to mention that I may make it that he actually is not even related to Brangel and Kathy. I haven't decided yet, but I actually may make him a step-sibling, but we're not going to get there yet. He is very moody. Uh, he is very brutish. He is very stubborn. Um, he is very much that stubborn, broody, uh, swords person, you know, in the back seat. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's just kind of grumbly all the time, and he's just very pessimistic. But the main thing that's interesting about him is he is very into history. He very much looks into the history of things in the world and brings those things up a lot. He's that guy, he's that guy who, um, is Catholic, but is, act, like, isn't be you know, but actually, for instance, would not necessarily bow down to a political party, because that's stupid kind of thing. He, again, it's, but, you know, and again, you may not necessarily agree with all his opinions, and as it turns out that some of the things that he believes in are right, and some of the things he believes in are wrong. But he's just very stubborn. He's, he has the strongest opinions of the group. Sander is the character that you are either going to love him or hate him because of that. And last and finally, we have Lily. Lily is special because she's the only non-human of the group. Well, she's half human. She's half human and half fairy, because that is a thing that can happen. Her special thing is that she can she can grow wings. Um, her wings are a little bit weaker than, than certain uh, fae, but she also can kind of just lose the wings and look like she's a human. And uh, But she also does have magical ability. In fact, she has great Kenley Ka, as I explained earlier. And uh, she is shy. She is extremely demure. Her whole thing is that she's been criticized her whole life because she is a halfwing and... Get it? Halfwing, half Okay. She's a, she's a halfwing and the Fae are... 
think that that's really bad. They don't like that at all because they know that she is. And so she's been constantly criticized and has found no belonging in anywhere. And so when she finds the group and they ask her to join, she's kind of like, all right, I'll join. She's very much the outsider of the group. Um, she doesn't really have a close connection with anybody. And this does become more important later on with the antagonists. <laughs> because not that she sides with them, but she may have a different morality than the group has as far as loyalty goes. And so she, but she's very, very shy. So her whole thing is she's kind of like, uh, was stuck in a castle her whole life. And now is trying to find out where her life, you know, what, what's my life's meaning. You know, she's really trying to find out where she you know, belongs in life and such like that. And I have some really exciting plans of her happy ending. And I'm very happy about, because originally I was going to go one way. And then I wasn't pleased with that. And now I'm very happy with where she's going to end up. So that's Lily. She's great. She's adorable. She's like, she, you can't hate her because she's really cute. She's just very shy and just really wants to make sure people get along. But she's got a, she brings an outsider perspective to a lot of things. She really is the person that helps shake everyone's like human only th way of thinking. Because as you can see, they're almost all humans. And which is not the original group that Marthana had, which is kind of weird. So those are my lovely characters. I think I'm going to stop here because I have gone on for way too long. I don't know how I'm going to cut this down. Sorry, Editor John. But somehow it'll be, it'll be what it is. So yeah, this is my 100th episode. To 100 more, I hope. I'll try to get these out more regularly. I'm planning on doing it once a week. It's just things are kind of weird. So but yeah, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed me explaining Crystal Crown. And I know I only touched the surface on a lot of things and was probably extremely confusing on a billion other things. But hopefully you guys had some fun. And uh, yeah, we'll see if this ever gets written. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you all have a wonderful day. I hope something amazing happens to you. Without further ado, I hope to see you all in the next episode. Bye-bye! Four more hours to Star Wars.